The Project Gutenberg ebook of the Poetics of Aristotle This ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.org. If you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this ebook. Title, The Poetics of Aristotle Author, Aristotle Translator, S. H. Butcher Release Date, November 1, 1999 Ebook Number 1974 Most Recently Updated, September 20, 2016 Language, English Credits, Produced by an Anonymous Volunteer, and David Widger start of the Project Gutenberg ebook The Poetics of Aristotle The Poetics of Aristotle by Aristotle A translation by S. H. Butcher Transcribers Annotations and Conventions, the translator left intact some Greek words to illustrate a specific point of the original discourse. In this transcription, in order to retain the accuracy of this text, those words are rendered by spelling out each Greek letter individually, such as Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta. The reader can distinguish these words by the enclosing braces. Where multiple words occur together, they are separated by the slash symbol for clarity. Readers who do not speak or read the Greek language will usually neither gain nor lose understanding by skipping over these passages. Those who understand Greek, however, may gain a deeper insight to the original meaning and distinctions expressed by Aristotle. Contents Aristotle's Poetics I 2 3 4 V 6 7 8 9 X 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 X X X X I X X I I X X I I I X X I V X X V X X V I Aristotle's Poetics I I propose to treat of poetry in itself and of its various kinds, noting the essential quality of each, to inquire into the structure of the plot as requisite to a good poem, into the number and nature of the parts of which a poem is composed, and similarly into whatever else falls within the same inquiry. Following, then, the order of nature, let us begin with the principles which come first. Epic poetry and tragedy, comedy also and dithyrambic, poetry, and the music of the flute and of the lyre in most of their forms, are all in their general conception modes of imitation. They differ, however, from one, another in three respects the medium, the objects, the manner, or mode of imitation, being in each case distinct. For as there are persons who, by conscious art or mere habit, imitate and represent various objects through the medium of color and form, or again by the voice, so in the arts above mentioned, taken as a whole, the imitation is produced by rhythm, language, or harmony, either singly or combined. Thus in the music of the flute and of the lyre, harmony and rhythm alone are employed, also in other arts, such as that of the shepherd's pipe, which are essentially similar to these. In dancing, rhythm alone is used without harmony, for even dancing imitates character, emotion, and action, by rhythmical movement. There is another art which imitates by means of language alone, and that either in prose or verse which, verse, again, may either combine different meters or consist of but one kind but this has hitherto been without a name. For there is no common term we could apply to the mimes of Saffron and Xenarchus and the Socratic dialogues on the one hand, and, on the other, to poetic imitations in iambic, elegiac, or any similar meter. People do, indeed, add the word maker or poet to the name of the meter, and speak of elegiac poets, or epic, that is, hexameter, poets, as if it were not the imitation that makes the poet, but the verse that entitles them all indiscriminately to the name. Even when a treatise on medicine or natural science is brought out in verse, the name of poet is by custom given to the author, and yet Homer and Empedocles have nothing in common but the meter, so that it would be right to call the one poet, the other physicist rather than poet. 
On the same principle, even if a writer in his poetic imitation were to combine all meters, as Chaeriman did in his Centaur, which is a medley composed of meters of all kinds, we should bring him to under the general term poet. So much then for these distinctions. There are, again, some arts which employ all the means above mentioned, namely, rhythm, tune, and meter. Such are dithyrambic and gnomic poetry, and also tragedy and comedy, but between them the difference is, that in the first two cases these means are all employed in combination, in the latter, now one means is employed, now another. Such, then, are the differences of the arts with respect to the medium of imitation. 2. Since the objects of imitation are men in action, and these men must be either of a higher or a lower type, for moral character mainly answers to these divisions, goodness and badness being the distinguishing marks of moral differences, it follows that we must represent men either as better than in real life, or as worse, or as they are. It is the same in painting. Polygnotus depicted men as nobler than they are, Pausin as less noble, Dionysius drew them true to life. Now it is evident that each of the modes of imitation above mentioned will exhibit these differences, and become a distinct kind in imitating objects that are thus distinct. Such diversities may be found even in dancing, flute playing, and lyre playing. So again in language, whether prose or verse unaccompanied by music. Homer, for example, makes men better than they are, Cleophon as they are, Hegemon the Thasian, the inventor of parodies, and Nico Chars, the author of the Deoliad, worse than they are. The same thing holds good of dithyrams and gnomes, here too one may portray different types, as Timotheus and Philoxenus differed in representing their Cyclopes. The same distinction marks off tragedy from comedy, for comedy aims at representing men as worse, tragedy as better than in actual life. 3. There is still a third difference the manner in which each of these objects may be imitated. For the medium being the same, and the objects the same, the poet may imitate by narration in which case he can either take another personality as Homer does, or speak in his own person, unchanged or he may present all his characters as living and moving before us. These, then, as we said at the beginning, are the three differences which distinguish artistic imitation the medium, the objects, and the manner. So that from one point of view, Sophocles is an imitator of the same kind as Homer for both imitate higher types of character, from another point of view, of the same kind as Aristophanes for both imitate persons acting and doing. Hence, some say, the name of drama is given to such poems, as representing action. For the same reason the Dorians claim the invention both of tragedy and comedy. The claim to comedy is put forward by the Megarians not only by those of Greece proper, who allege that it originated under their democracy, but also by the Megarians of Sicily, for the poet Epicharmus, who is much earlier than Chionides and Magnus, belonged to that country. Tragedy too is claimed by certain Dorians of the Peloponnese. In each case they appeal to the evidence of language. The outlying villages, they say, are by them called Kappa Omega Mu Alpha Iota, by the Athenians Delta Eta Mu Iota, and they assume that comedians were so named not from Kappa Omega Mu Alpha Zeta Epsilon Iota Nu, to revel, but because they wandered from village to village, Kappa Alpha Tau Alpha slash Kappa Omega Mu Alpha Sigma, being excluded contemptuously from the city. They add also that the Dorian word for doing is delta rho alpha nu, and the Athenian, pi rho alpha tau tau epsilon iota nu. This may suffice as to the number and nature of the various modes of imitation. For poetry in general seems to have sprung from two causes, each of them lying deep in our nature. First, the instinct of imitation is implanted in man from childhood, one difference between him and other animals being that he is the most imitative of living creatures, and through imitation learns his earliest lessons, 
and no less universal is the pleasure felt in things imitated. We have evidence of this in the facts of experience. Objects which in themselves we view with pain, we delight to contemplate when reproduced with minute fidelity, such as the forms of the most ignoble animals and of dead bodies. The cause of this again is, that to learn gives the liveliest pleasure, not only to philosophers but to men in general, whose capacity, however, of learning is more limited. Thus the reason why men enjoy seeing a likeness is, that in contemplating it they find themselves learning or inferring, and saying perhaps, ah, that is he. For if you happen not to have seen the original, the pleasure will be due not to the imitation as such, but to the execution, the coloring, or some such other cause. Imitation, then, is one instinct of our nature. Next, there is the instinct for harmony and rhythm, meters being manifestly sections of rhythm. Persons, therefore, starting with this natural gift developed by degrees their special aptitudes, till their rude improvisations gave birth to poetry. Poetry now diverged in two directions, according to the individual character of the writers. The graver spirits imitated noble actions, and the actions of good men. The more trivial sort imitated the actions of meaner persons, at first composing satires, as the former did hymns to the gods and the praises of famous men. A poem of the satirical kind cannot indeed be put down to any author earlier than Homer, though many such writers probably there were. But from Homer onward, instances can be cited his own margits, for example, and other similar compositions. The appropriate meter was also here introduced, hence the measure is still called the iambic or lampooning measure, being that in which people lampooned one another. Thus the older poets were distinguished as writers of heroic or of lampooning verse. As, in the serious style, Homer is preeminent among poets, for he alone combined dramatic form with excellence of imitation, so he too first laid down the main lines of comedy, by dramatizing the ludicrous instead of writing personal satire. His Margits bears the same relation to comedy that the Iliad and Odyssey do to tragedy. But when tragedy and comedy came to light, the two classes of poets still followed their natural bent, the lampooners became writers of comedy, and the epic poets were succeeded by tragedians, since the drama was a larger and higher form of art. Whether tragedy has as yet perfected its proper types or not, and whether it is to be judged in itself, or in relation also to the audience this raises another question. Be that as it may, tragedy as also comedy was at first mere improvisation. The one originated with the authors of the dithyram, the other with those of the phallic songs, which are still in use in many of our cities. Tragedy advanced by slow degrees, each new element that showed itself was in turn developed. Having passed through many changes, it found its natural form, and there it stopped. Aeschylus first introduced a second actor, he diminished the importance of the chorus, and assigned the leading part to the dialogue. Sophocles raised the number of actors to three, and added scene painting. Moreover, it was not till late that the short plot was discarded for one of greater compass, and the grotesque diction of the earlier satiric form for the stately manner of tragedy. The iambic measure then replaced the trochaic tetrameter, which was originally employed when the poetry was of the satiric order, and had greater affinities with dancing. Once dialogue had come in, nature herself discovered the appropriate measure. For the iambic is, of all measures, the most colloquial, we see it in the fact that conversational speech runs into iambic lines more frequently than into any other kind of verse, rarely into hexameters, and only when we drop the colloquial intonation. The additions to the number of episodes or acts, and the other accessories of which tradition, tells, must be taken as already described, for to discuss them in detail would, doubtless, be a large undertaking. V-comedy is, as we have said, 
an imitation of characters of a lower type, not, however, in the full sense of the word bad, the ludicrous being merely a subdivision of the ugly. It consists in some defect or ugliness which is not painful or destructive. To take an obvious example, the comic mask is ugly and distorted, but does not imply pain. The successive changes through which tragedy passed, and the authors of these changes, are well known, whereas comedy has had no history, because it was not at first treated seriously. It was late before the Archon granted a comic chorus to a poet, the performers were till then voluntary. Comedy had already taken definite shape when comic poets, distinctively so called, are heard of. Who furnished it with masks, or prologues, or increased the number of actors these and other similar details remain unknown. As for the plot, it came originally from Sicily, but of Athenian writers Crates was the first who, abandoning the iambic or lampooning form, generalized his themes and plots. Epic poetry agrees with tragedy in so far as it is an imitation in verse of characters of a higher type. They differ, in that epic poetry admits but one kind of meter, and is narrative in form. They differ, again, in their length, for tragedy endeavors, as far as possible, to confine itself to a single revolution of the sun, or but slightly to exceed this limit, whereas the epic action has no limits of time. This, then, is a second point of difference, though at first the same freedom was admitted in tragedy as in epic poetry. Of their constituent parts some are common to both, some peculiar to tragedy, whoever, therefore, knows what is good or bad tragedy, knows also about epic poetry. All the elements of an epic poem are found in tragedy, but the elements of a tragedy are not all found in the epic poem. Six of the poetry which imitates in hexameter verse, and of comedy, we will speak hereafter. Let us now discuss tragedy, resuming its formal definition, as resulting from what has been already said. Tragedy, then, is an imitation of an action that is serious, complete, and of a certain magnitude, in language embellished with each kind of artistic ornament, the several kinds being found in separate parts of the play, in the form of action, not of narrative, through pity and fear affecting the proper purgation of these emotions. By language embellished, I mean language into which rhythm, harmony, and song enter. By the several kinds in separate parts, I mean, that some parts are rendered through the medium of verse alone, others again with the aid of song. Now as tragic imitation implies persons acting, it necessarily follows, in the first place, that spectacular equipment will be a part of tragedy. Next, song and diction, for these are the medium of imitation. By diction I mean the mere metrical arrangement of the words, as for song, it is a term whose sense everyone understands. Again, tragedy is the imitation of an action, and an action implies personal agents, who necessarily possess certain distinctive qualities both of character and thought, for it is by these that we qualify actions themselves, and these thought and character are the two natural causes from which actions spring, and on actions again all success or failure depends. Hence, the plot is the imitation of the action, for by plot I here mean the arrangement of the incidents. By character I mean that in virtue of which we ascribe certain qualities to the agents. Thought is required wherever a statement is proved, or, it may be, a general truth enunciated. Every tragedy, therefore, must have six parts, which parts determine its quality namely, plot, character, diction, thought, spectacle, song. Two of the parts constitute the medium of imitation, one the manner, and three the objects of imitation. And these complete the list. These elements have been employed, we may say, by the poets to a man, in fact, every play contains spectacular elements as well as character, 
plot, diction, song, and thought. But most important of all is the structure of the incidents. For tragedy is an imitation, not of men, but of an action and of life, and life consists in action, and its end is a mode of action, not a quality. Now character determines men's qualities, but it is by their actions that they are happy or the reverse. Dramatic action, therefore, is not with a view to the representation of character, character comes in as subsidiary to the actions. Hence the incidents and the plot are the end of a tragedy, and the end is the chief thing of all. Again, without action there cannot be a tragedy, there may be without character. The tragedies of most of our modern poets fail in the rendering of character, and of poets in general this is often true. It is the same in painting, and here lies the difference between Zeuxis and Polygnotus. Polygnotus delineates character well, the style of Zeuxis is devoid of ethical quality. Again, if you string together a set of speeches expressive of character, and well finished in point of diction and thought, you will not produce the essential tragic effect nearly so well as with a play which, however deficient in these respects, yet has a plot and artistically constructed incidents. Besides which, the most powerful elements of emotional, interest in tragedy peripatia or reversal of the situation, and recognition scenes are parts of the plot. A further proof is, that novices in the art attain to finish, of diction and precision of portraiture before they can construct the plot. It is the same with almost all the early poets. The plot, then, is the first principle, and, as it were, the soul of a tragedy, character holds the second place. A similar fact is seen in painting. The most beautiful colors, laid on confusedly, will not give as much pleasure as the chalk outline of a portrait. Thus tragedy is the imitation of an action, and of the agents mainly with a view to the action. Third in order is thought that is, the faculty of saying what is possible and pertinent in given circumstances. In the case of oratory, this is the function of the political art and of the art of rhetoric, and so indeed the older poets make their characters speak the language of civic life, the poets of our time, the language of the rhetoric eons. Character is that which reveals moral purpose, showing what kind of things a man chooses or avoids. Speeches, therefore, which do not make this manifest, or in which the speaker does not choose or avoid anything whatever, are not expressive of character. Thought, on the other hand, is found where something is proved to be, or not to be, or a general maxim is enunciated. Fourth among the elements enumerated comes diction, by which I mean, as has been already said, the expression of the meaning in words, and its essence is the same both in verse and prose. Of the remaining elements song holds the chief place among the embellishments. The spectacle has, indeed, an emotional attraction of its own, but, of all the parts, it is the least artistic, and connected least with the art of poetry. For the power of tragedy, we may be sure, is felt even apart from representation and actors. Besides, the production of spectacular effects depends more on the art of the stage machinist than on that of the poet. Seven these principles being established, let us now discuss the proper structure of the plot, since this is the first and most important thing in tragedy. Now, according to our definition, tragedy is an imitation of an action that is complete and whole and of a certain magnitude, for there may be a whole that is wanting in magnitude. A whole is that which has a beginning, a middle, and an end. A beginning is that which does not itself follow anything by causal necessity, but after which something naturally is or comes to be. An end, on the contrary, is that which itself naturally follows some other thing, either by necessity, or as a rule, but has nothing following it. A middle is that which follows something as some other thing follows it. A well-constructed plot, therefore, 
must neither begin nor end at haphazard, but conform to these principles. Again, a beautiful object, whether it be a living organism or any whole composed of parts, must not only have an orderly arrangement of parts, but must also be of a certain magnitude, for beauty depends on magnitude and order. Hence a very small animal organism cannot be beautiful, for the view of it is confused, the object being seen in an almost imperceptible moment of time. Nor, again, can one of vast size be beautiful, for as the eye cannot take it all in at once, the unity and sense of the whole is lost for the spectator, as for instance if there were one a thousand miles long. As, therefore, in the case of animate bodies and organisms a certain magnitude is necessary, and a magnitude which may be easily embraced in one view, so in the plot, a certain length is necessary, and a length which can be easily embraced by the memory. The limit of length in relation to dramatic competition and sensuous presentment, is no part of artistic theory. For had it been the rule for a hundred tragedies to compete together, the performance would have been regulated by the water clock as indeed we are told was formerly done. But the limit as fixed by the nature of the drama itself is this, the greater the length, the more beautiful will the piece be by reason of its size, provided that the whole be perspicuous. And to define the matter roughly, we may say that the proper magnitude is comprised within such limits, that the sequence of events, according to the law of probability or necessity, will admit of a change from bad fortune to good, or from good fortune to bad. Eight unity of plot does not, as some persons think, consist in the unity of the hero. For infinitely various are the incidents in one man's life which cannot be reduced to unity, and so, too, there are many actions of one man out of which we cannot make one action. Hence, the error, as it appears, of all poets who have composed a Heraclid, a Theseid, or other poems of the kind. They imagine that as Heracles was one man, the story of Heracles must also be a unity. But Homer, as in all else he is of surpassing merit, here too whether from art or natural genius seems to have happily discerned the truth. In composing the Odyssey he did not include all the adventures of Odysseus such as his wound on Parnassus, or his feigned madness at the mustering of the host incidents between which there was no necessary or probable connection, but he made the Odyssey, and likewise the Iliad, to center round an action that in our sense of the word is one. As therefore, in the other imitative arts, the imitation is one when the object imitated is one, so the plot, being an imitation of an action, must imitate one action and that a whole, the structural union of the parts being such that, if any one of them is displaced or removed, the whole will be disjointed and disturbed. For a thing whose presence or absence makes no visible difference, is not an organic part of the whole. 9 It is, moreover, evident from what has been said, that it is not the function of the poet to relate what has happened, but what may happen what is possible according to the law of probability or necessity. The poet and the historian differ not by writing in verse or in prose. The work of Herodotus might be put into verse, and it would still be a species of history, with meter no less than without it. The true difference is that one relates what has happened, the other what may happen. Poetry, therefore, is a more philosophical and a higher thing than history, for poetry tends to express the universal, history the particular. By the universal, I mean how a person of a certain type will on occasion speak or act, according to the law of probability or necessity, and it is this universality at which poetry aims in the names she attaches to the personages. The particular is for example what Alcibiades did or suffered. In comedy this is already apparent, for here the poet first constructs the plot on the lines of probability, and then inserts characteristic names, unlike the lampooners who write about particular individuals. But tragedians still keep to real names, the reason being that what is possible is credible, 
what has not happened we do not at once feel sure to be possible, but what has happened is manifestly possible, otherwise it would not have happened. Still there are even some tragedies in which there are only one or two well-known names, the rest being fictitious. In others, none are well known, as in Agathon's Antheus, where incidents and names alike are fictitious, and yet they give none the less pleasure. We must not, therefore, at all costs keep to the received legends, which are the usual subjects of tragedy. Indeed, it would be absurd to attempt it, for even subjects that are known are known only to a few, and yet give pleasure to all. It clearly follows that the poet or maker should be the maker of plots rather than of verses, since he is a poet because he imitates, and what he imitates are actions. And even if he chances to take an historical subject, he is nonetheless a poet, for there is no reason why some events that have actually happened should not conform to the law of the probable and possible, and in virtue of that quality in them he is their poet or maker. Of all plots and actions the episodic are the worst. I call a plot episodic in which the episodes or acts succeed one another without probable or necessary sequence. Bad poets compose such pieces by their own fault, good poets, to please the players, for, as they write show pieces for competition, they stretch the plot beyond its capacity, and are often forced to break the natural continuity. But again, tragedy is an imitation not only of a complete action, but of events inspiring fear or pity. Such an effect is best produced when the events come on us by surprise, and the effect is heightened when, at the same time, they follow as cause and effect. The tragic wonder will they be greater than if they happened of themselves or by accident, for even coincidences are most striking when they have an air of design. We may instance the statue of Midas at Argos, which fell upon his murderer while he was a spectator at a festival, and killed him. Such events seem not to be due to mere chance. Plots, therefore, constructed on these principles are necessarily the best. X plots are either simple or complex, for the actions in real life, of which the plots are an imitation, obviously show a similar distinction. An action which is one and continuous in the sense above defined, I call simple, when the change of fortune takes place without reversal of the situation and without recognition. A complex action is one in which the change is accompanied by such reversal, or by recognition, or by both. These last should arise from the internal structure of the plot, so that what follows should be the necessary or probable result of the preceding action. It makes all the difference whether any given event is a case of proto hoc or post hoc. 11. Reversal of the situation is a change by which the action veers round to its opposite, subject always to our rule of probability or necessity. Thus in the Oedipus, the messenger comes to cheer Oedipus and free him from his alarms about his mother, but by revealing who he is, he produces the opposite effect. Again in the Lincers, Lincers is being led away to his death, and Dinoz goes with him, meaning, to slay him, but the outcome of the preceding incidents is that Dinoz is killed and Lincers saved. Recognition, as the name indicates, is a change from ignorance to knowledge, producing love or hate between the persons destined by the poet for good or bad fortune. The best form of recognition is coincident with the reversal of the situation, as in the Oedipus. There are indeed other forms. Even inanimate things of the most trivial kind may in a sense be objects of recognition. Again, we may recognize or discover whether a person has done a thing or not. But the recognition which is most intimately connected with the plot and action is, as we have said, the recognition of persons. This recognition, combined, with reversal, will produce either pity or fear, and actions producing these effects are those which, by our definition, tragedy represents. Moreover, it is upon such situations that the issues of good or bad fortune will depend. Recognition, then, 
being between persons, it may happen that one person only is recognized by the other when the latter is already known or it may be necessary that the recognition should be on both sides. Thus Iphigenia is revealed to Orestes by the sending of the letter, but another act of recognition is required to make Orestes known to Iphigenia. Two parts, then, of the plot reversal of the situation and recognition turn upon surprises. A third part is the scene of suffering. The scene of suffering is a destructive or painful action, such as death on the stage, bodily agony, wounds, and the like. 12. The parts of tragedy which must be treated as elements of the whole have been already mentioned. We now come to the quantitative parts, and the separate parts into which tragedy is divided, namely, prologue, episode, exode, choric song, this last being divided into parode and stas imen. These are common to all plays, peculiar to some are the songs of actors from the stage and the kamoi. The prologue is that entire part of a tragedy which precedes the parode of the chorus. The episode is that entire part of a tragedy which is between complete choric songs. The exode is that entire part of a tragedy which has no choric song after it. Of the choric part the parode is the first undivided utterance of the chorus, the stas imen is a choric ode without onopagists or trochaic tetrameters, the kamas is a joint lamentation of chorus and actors. The parts of tragedy which must be treated as elements of the whole have been already mentioned. The quantitative parts the separate parts into which it is divided are here enumerated. 13 As the sequel to what has already been said, we must proceed to consider what the poet should aim at, and what he should avoid, in constructing his plots, and by what means the specific effect of tragedy will be produced. A perfect tragedy should, as we have seen, be arranged not on the simple but on the complex plan. It should, moreover, imitate actions which excite pity and fear, this being the distinctive mark of tragic imitation. It follows plainly, in the first place, that the change, of fortune presented must not be the spectacle of a virtuous man brought from prosperity to adversity, for this moves neither pity nor fear, it merely shocks us. Nor, again, that of a bad man passing from adversity to prosperity, for nothing can be more alien to the spirit of tragedy, it possesses no single tragic quality, it neither satisfies the moral sense nor calls forth pity or fear. Nor, again, should the downfall of the utter villain be exhibited. A plot of this kind would, doubtless, satisfy the moral sense, but it would inspire neither pity nor fear, for pity is aroused by unmerited misfortune, fear by the misfortune of a man like ourselves. Such an event, therefore, will be neither pitiful nor terrible. There remains, then, the character between these two extremes that of a man who is not eminently good and just yet whose misfortune is brought about not by vice or depravity, but by some error or frailty. He must be one who is highly renowned and prosperous a personage like Oedipus, Thyestes, or other illustrious men of such families. A well-constructed plot should, therefore, be single in its issue, rather than double as some maintain. The change of fortune should be not from bad to good, but, reversely, from good to bad. It should come about as the result not of vice, but of some great error or frailty, in a character either such as we have described, or better rather than worse. The practice of the stage bears out our view. At first the poets recounted any legend that came in their way. Now, the best tragedies are founded on the story of a few houses, on the fortunes of Alcmion, Oedipus, Orestes, Meleager, Thyestes, Telephus, and those others who have done or suffered something terrible. A tragedy, then, to be perfect according to the rules of art should be of this construction. Hence they are in error who censure Euripides just because he follows this principle in his plays, many of which end unhappily. It is, as we have said, the right ending. The best proof is that on the stage and in dramatic competition, 
such plays, if well worked out, are the most tragic in effect, and Euripides, faulty though he may be in the general management of his subject, yet is felt to be the most tragic of the poets. In the second rank comes the kind of tragedy which some place first. Like the Odyssey, it has a double thread of plot, and also an opposite catastrophe for the good and for the bad. It is accounted the best because of the weakness of the spectators, for the poet is guided in what he writes by the wishes of his audience. The pleasure, however, thence derived is not the true tragic pleasure. It is proper rather to comedy, where those who, in the piece, are the deadliest enemies like Orestes and Aegisthus quit the stage as friends at the close, and no one slays or is slain. Fourteen fear and pity may be aroused by spectacular means, but they may also result from the inner structure of the piece, which is the better way, and indicates a superior poet. For the plot ought to be so constructed that, even without the aid of the eye, he who hears the tale told will thrill with horror and melt to pity at what takes place. This is the impression we should receive from hearing the story of the Oedipus. But to produce this effect by the mere spectacle is a less artistic method, and dependent on extraneous aids. Those who employ spectacular means to create a sense not of the terrible but only of the monstrous, are strangers to the purpose of tragedy, for we must not demand of tragedy any and every kind of pleasure, but only that which is proper to it. And since the pleasure which the poet should afford is that which comes from pity and fear through imitation, it is evident that this quality must be impressed upon the incidents. Let us then determine what are the circumstances which strike us as terrible or pitiful. Actions capable of this effect must happen between persons who are either friends or enemies or indifferent to one another. If an enemy kills an enemy, there is nothing to excite pity either in the act or the intention except so far as the suffering in itself is pitiful. So again with indifferent persons. But when the tragic incident occurs between those who are near or dear to one another if, for example, a brother kills, or intends to kill, a brother, a son his father, a mother her son, a son his mother, or any other deed of the kind is done these are the situations to be looked for by the poet. He may not indeed destroy the framework of the received legends the fact, for instance, that Clytemnestra was slain by Orestes and Eryphile by Alcmion but he ought to show invention of his own, and skillfully handle the traditional material. Let us explain more clearly what is meant by skillful handling. The action may be done consciously and with knowledge of the persons, in the manner of the older poets. It is thus too that Euripides makes Medea slay her children. Or, again, the deed of horror may be done, but done in ignorance, and the tie of kinship or friendship be discovered afterwards. The Oedipus of Sophocles is an example. Here, indeed, the incident is outside the drama proper, but cases occur where it falls within the action of the play, one may cite the Alcmion of Astydamas, or Telegonus in the wounded Odysseus. Again, there is a third case, to be about to act with knowledge of the persons and then not to act. The fourth case is, when someone is about to do an irreparable deed through ignorance, and makes the discovery before it is done. These are the only possible ways. For the deed must either be done or not done and that wittingly or unwittingly. But of all these ways, to be about to act knowing the persons, and then not to act, is the worst. It is shocking without being tragic, for no disaster follows. It is, therefore, never, or very rarely, found in poetry. One instance, however, is in the Antigone, where Hemon threatens to kill Creon. The next and better way is that the deed should be perpetrated. Still better, that it should be perpetrated in ignorance, and the discovery made afterwards. There is then nothing to shock us, while the discovery produces a startling effect. The last case is the best, as when in the Crisphant Merope is about to slay her son, but, 
recognizing who he is, spares his life. So in the Iphigenia, the sister recognizes the brother just in time. Again in the Heli, the son recognizes the mother when on the point of giving her up. This, then, is why a few families only, as has been already observed, furnish the subjects of tragedy. It was not art, but happy chance, that led the poets in search of subjects to impress the tragic quality upon their plots. They are compelled, therefore, to have recourse to those houses whose history contains moving incidents like these. Enough has now been said concerning the structure of the incidents, and the right kind of plot. 15. In respect of character there are four things to be aimed at. First, and most important, it must be good. Now any speech or action that manifests moral purpose of any kind will be expressive of character, the character will be good if the purpose is good. This rule is relative to each class. Even a woman may be good, and also a slave, though the woman may be said to be an inferior being, and the slave quite worthless. The second thing to aim at is propriety. There is a type of manly valor, but valor in a woman, or unscrupulous cleverness, is inappropriate. Thirdly, character must be true to life, for this is a distinct thing from goodness and propriety, as here described. The fourth point is consistency, for though the subject of the imitation, who suggested the type, be inconsistent, still he must be consistently inconsistent. As an example of motiveless degradation of character, we have many laws in the Orestes, of character indecorous and inappropriate, the lament of Odysseus in the Scylla, and the speech of Melanippe, of inconsistency, the Iphigenia at Aulis for Iphigenia the suppliant in no way resembles her later self. As in the structure of the plot, so too in the portraiture of character, the poet should always aim either at the necessary or the probable. Thus a person of a given character should speak or act in a given way, by the rule either of necessity or of probability, just as this event should follow that by necessary or probable sequence. It is therefore evident that the unraveling of the plot, no less than the complication, must arise out of the plot itself, it must not be brought about by the deus ex machina as in the media, or in the return of the Greeks in the Iliad. The deus ex machina should be employed only for events external to the drama for antecedent or subsequent events, which lie beyond the range of human knowledge, and which require to be reported or foretold, for to the gods we ascribe the power of seeing all things. Within the action there must be nothing irrational. If the irrational cannot be excluded, it should be outside the scope of the tragedy. Such is the irrational element in the Oedipus of Sophocles. Again, since tragedy is an imitation of persons who are above the common level, the example of good portrait painters should be followed. They, while reproducing the distinctive form of the original, make a likeness which is true to life and yet more beautiful. So too the poet, in representing men who are irascible or indolent, or have other defects of character, should preserve the type and yet ennoble it. In this way Achilles is portrayed by Agathon and Homer. These then are rules the poet should observe. Nor should he neglect those appeals to the senses, which, though not among the essentials, are the concomitants of poetry, for here too there is much room for error. But of this enough has been said in our published treatises. 16. What recognition is has been already explained. We will now enumerate its kinds. First, the least artistic form, which, from poverty of wit, is most commonly employed recognition by signs. Of these some are congenital such as the spear which the earth-born race bear on their bodies, or the stars introduced by Carcinus in his Thyestes. Others are acquired after birth, and of these some are bodily marks, as scars, some external tokens, as necklaces, or the little arc in the tyro by which the discovery is effected. Even these admit of more or less skillful treatment. 
Thus in the recognition of Odysseus by his scar, the discovery is made in one way by the nurse, in another by the swine herds. The use of tokens for the express purpose of proof and, indeed, any formal proof with or without tokens is a less artistic mode of recognition. A better kind is that which comes about by a turn of incident, as in the bath scene in the Odyssey. Next come the recognitions invented at will by the poet, and on that account wanting in art. For example, Orestes in the Iphigenia reveals the fact that he is Orestes. She, indeed, makes herself known by the letter, but he, by speaking himself, and saying what the poet, not what the plot requires. This, therefore, is nearly allied to the fault above mentioned for Orestes might as well have brought tokens with him. Another similar instance is the voice of the shuttle in the Tereus of Sophocles. The third kind depends on memory when the sight of some object awakens a feeling, as in the Cyprians of Disogenes, where the hero breaks into tears on seeing the picture, or again in the Lay of Alcinous, where Odysseus, hearing the minstrel play the lyre, recalls the past and weeps, and hence the recognition. The fourth kind is by process of reasoning. Thus in the Choephori, some one resembling me has come, no one resembles me but Orestes, therefore Orestes has come. Such too is the discovery made by Iphigenia in the play of Polyidus the Sophist. It was a natural reflection for Orestes to make, so I too must die at the altar like my sister. So, again, in the Tidius of Theodectes, the father says, I came to find my son, and I lose my own life. So too in the Phenity, the women, on seeing the place, inferred their fate here we are doomed to die, for here we were cast forth. Again, there is a composite kind of recognition involving false inference on the part of one of the characters, as in the Odysseus disguised as a messenger. A said, that no one else was able to bend the bow, hence B, the disguised Odysseus, imagined that A would, recognize the bow which, in fact, he had not seen, and to bring about a recognition by this means that the expectation A would recognize the bow is false inference. But, of all recognitions, the best is that which arises from the incidents themselves, where the startling discovery is made by natural means. Such is that in the Oedipus of Sophocles, and in the Iphigenia, for it was natural that Iphigenia should wish to dispatch a letter. These recognitions alone dispense with the artificial aid of tokens or amulets. Next come the recognitions by process of reasoning. 17. In constructing the plot and working it out with the proper diction, the poet should place the scene, as far as possible, before his eyes. In this way, seeing everything with the utmost vividness, as if he were a spectator of the action, he will discover what is in keeping with it, and be most unlikely to overlook inconsistencies. The need of such a rule is shown by the fault found in Carcinus. Amphieros was on his way from the temple. This fact escaped the observation of one who did not see the situation. On the stage, however, the piece failed, the audience being offended at the oversight. Again, the poet should work out his play, to the best of his power, with appropriate gestures, for those who feel emotion are most convincing through natural sympathy with the characters they represent, and one who is agitated storms, one who is angry rages, with the most lifelike reality. Hence poetry implies either a happy gift of nature or a strain of madness. In the one case a man can take the mold of any character, in the other, he is lifted out of his proper self. As for the story, whether the poet takes it ready-made or constructs it for himself, he should first sketch its general outline, and then fill in the episodes and amplify in detail. The general plan may be illustrated by the Iphigenia. A young girl is sacrificed, she disappears mysteriously from the eyes of those who sacrificed her, she is transported to another country, 
where the custom is to offer up all strangers to the goddess. To this ministry she is appointed. Some time later her own brother chances to arrive. The fact that the oracle for some reason ordered him to go there, is outside the general plan of the play. The purpose, again, of his coming is outside the action proper. However, he comes, he is seized, and, when on the point of being sacrificed, reveals who he is. The mode of recognition may be either that of Euripides or of Polyidus, in whose play he exclaims very naturally so it was not my sister only, but I too, who was doomed to be sacrificed, and by that remark he is saved. After this, the names being once given, it remains to fill in the episodes. We must see that they are relevant to the action. In the case of Orestes, for example, there is the madness which led to his capture, and his deliverance by means of the purificatory rite. In the drama, the episodes are short, but it is these that give extension to epic poetry. Thus the story of the Odyssey can be stated briefly. A certain man is absent from home for many years, he is jealously watched by Poseidon, and left desolate. Meanwhile his home is in a wretched plight suitors are wasting his substance and plotting against his son. At length, tempest-tossed, he himself arrives, he makes certain persons acquainted with him, he attacks the suitors with his own hand, and is himself preserved while he destroys them. This is the essence of the plot, the rest is episode. 18 Every tragedy falls into two parts complication and unraveling or denouement. Incidents extraneous to the action are frequently combined with a portion of the action proper, to form the complication, the rest is the unraveling. By the complication I mean all that extends from the beginning of the action to the part which marks the turning point to good or bad fortune. The unraveling is that which extends from the beginning of the change to the end. Thus, in the Lincers of Theodectes, the complication consists of the incidents presupposed in the drama, the seizure of the child, and then again, the unraveling extends from the accusation of murder to the end. There are four kinds of tragedy, the complex, depending entirely on reversal of the situation and recognition, the pathetic, where the motive is passion, comma such as the tragedies on Ajax and Ixion, the ethical, where the motives are ethical, comma such as the Thyatides and the Peleus. The fourth kind is the simple, we here exclude the purely spectacular element, exemplified by the four sides, the Prometheus, and scenes laid in Hades. The poet should endeavor, if possible, to combine all poetic elements, or failing that, the greatest number and those the most important, the more so, in face of the caviling criticism of the day. For whereas there have hitherto been good poets, each in his own branch, the critics now expect one man to surpass all others in their several lines of excellence. In speaking of a tragedy as the same or different, the best test to take is the plot. Identity exists where the complication and unraveling are the same. Many poets tie the knot well, but unravel it ill. Both arts, however, should always be mastered. Again, the poet should remember what has been often said, and not make an epic structure into a tragedy by an epic structure I mean one with a multiplicity of plots as if, for instance, you were to make a tragedy out of the entire story of the Iliad. In the epic poem, owing to its length, each part assumes its proper magnitude. In the drama the result is far from answering to the poet's expectation. The proof is that the poets who have dramatized the whole story of the fall of Troy, instead of selecting portions, like Euripides, or who have taken the whole tale of Niobe, and not a part of her story, like Aeschylus, either fail utterly or meet with poor success on the stage. Even Agathon has been known to fail from this one defect. In his reversals of the situation, however, he shows a marvelous skill in the effort to hit the popular taste to produce a tragic effect that satisfies the moral sense. 
This effect is produced when the clever rogue, like Sisyphus, is outwitted, or the brave villain defeated. Such an event is probable in Agathon's sense of the word, it is probable, he says, that many things should happen contrary to probability. The chorus too should be regarded as one of the actors, it should be an integral part of the whole, and share in the action, in the manner not of Euripides but of Sophocles. As for the later poets, their choral songs pertain as little to the subject of the piece as to that of any other tragedy. They are, therefore, sung as mere interludes, a practice first begun by Agathon. Yet what difference is there between introducing such choral interludes, and transferring a speech, or even a whole act, from one play to another? 19 It remains to speak of diction and thought, the other parts of tragedy having been already discussed. Concerning thought, we may assume what is said in the rhetoric, to which inquiry the subject more strictly belongs. Under thought is included every effect which has to be produced by speech, the subdivisions being proof and refutation, the excitation of the feelings, such as pity, fear, anger, and the like, the suggestion of importance or its opposite. Now, it is evident that the dramatic incidents must be treated from the same points of view as the dramatic speeches, when the object is to evoke the sense of pity, fear, importance, or probability. The only difference is, that the incidents should speak for themselves without verbal exposition, while the effects aimed at in speech should be produced by the speaker, and as a result of the speech. For what were the business of a speaker, if the thought were revealed quite apart from what he says. Next, as regards diction. One branch of the inquiry treats of the modes of utterance. But this province of knowledge belongs to the art of delivery and to the masters of that science. It includes, for instance what is a command, a prayer, a statement, a threat, a question, an answer, and so forth. To know or not to know these things involves no serious censure upon the poet's art. For who can admit the fault imputed to Homer by Protagoras that in the words, sing, goddess, of the wrath, he gives a command under the idea that he utters a prayer. For to tell someone to do a thing or not to do it is, he says, a command. We may, therefore, pass this over as an inquiry that belongs to another art, not to poetry. XX language in general includes the following parts letter, syllable, connecting word, noun, verb, inflection or case, sentence, or phrase. A letter is an indivisible sound, yet not every such sound, but only one which can form part of a group of sounds. For even brutes utter indivisible sounds, none of which I call a letter. The sound I mean may be either a vowel, a semi-vowel, or a mute. A vowel is that which without impact of tongue or lip has an audible sound. A semi-vowel, that which with such impact has an audible sound, as S and R. A mute, that which with such impact has by itself no sound, but joined to a vowel sound becomes audible, as G and D. These are distinguished according to the form assumed by the mouth and the place where they are produced, according as they are aspirated or smooth, long, or short, as they are acute, grave, or of an intermediate tone, which inquiry belongs in detail to the writers on meter. A syllable is a non-significant sound, composed of a mute and a vowel, for gr without a is a syllable, as also with a gra. But the investigation of these differences belongs also to metrical science. A connecting word is a non significant sound, which neither causes nor hinders the union of many sounds into one significant sound, it may be placed at either end or in the middle of a sentence. Or, a non significant sound, which out of several sounds, each of them significant, is capable of forming one significant sound as alpha mu theta iota pi epsilon rho iota, and the like. Or, a non-significant sound, which marks the beginning, end, or division of a sentence, such, however, 
that it cannot correctly stand by itself at the beginning of a sentence, as mu epsilon nu, eta tau omicron iota, delta epsilon. A noun is a composite significant sound, not marking time, of which no part is in itself significant, for in double or compound words we do not employ the separate parts as if each were in itself significant. Thus in Theodorus, God given, the delta omega rho omicron nu or gift is not in itself significant. A verb is a composite significant sound, marking time, in which, as in the noun, no part is in itself significant. For man, or white does not express the idea of when, but he walks, or he has walked does connote time, present, or past. Inflection belongs both to the noun and verb, and expresses either the relation of, to, or the like, or that of number, whether one or many, as man or men, or the modes or tones in actual delivery, e.g. a question or a command. Did he go, and go are verbal inflections of this kind. A sentence or phrase is a composite significant sound, some at least of whose parts are in themselves significant, for not every such group of words consists of verbs and nouns the definition of man, for example but it may dispense even with the verb. Still it will always have some significant part, as in walking, or clean son of clean. A sentence or phrase may form a unity in two ways either as signifying one thing, or as consisting of several parts linked together. Thus the Iliad is one by the linking together of parts, the definition of man by the unity of the thing signified. XXI words are of two kinds, simple and double. By simple I mean those composed of non-significant elements, such as gamma ETA. By double or compound, those composed either of a significant and non-significant element, though within the whole word no element is significant, or of elements that are both significant. A word may likewise be triple, quadruple, or multiple in form, like so many Massilian expressions, e.g. Hermochaicosanthus who prayed to Father Zeus. Every word is either current, or strange, or metaphorical, or ornamental, or newly coined, or lengthened, or contracted, or altered. By a current or proper word I mean one which is in general use among a people, by a strange word, one which is in use in another country. Plainly, therefore, the same word may be at once strange and current, but not in relation to the same people. The word sigma iota gamma upsilon nu omicron nu, lance, is to the Cyprians a current term but to us a strange one. Metaphor is the application of an alien name by transference either from genus to species, or from species to genus, or from species to species, or by analogy, that is, proportion. Thus from genus to species, as, there lies my ship, for lying at anchor is a species of lying. From species to genus, as, verily ten thousand noble deeds hath Odysseus wrought, for ten thousand is a species of large number, and is here used for a large number generally. From species to species, as, with blade of bronze drew away the life, and cleft the water with the vessel of unyielding bronze. Here alpha rho upsilon rho alpha iota, to draw away, is used for tau alpha mu epsilon iota nu, to cleave, and tau alpha mu epsilon iota nu again for alpha rho upsilon alpha iota comma each being a species of taking away. Analogy or proportion is when the second term is to the first as the fourth to the third. We may then use the fourth for the second, or the second for the fourth. Sometimes too we qualify the metaphor by adding the term to which the proper word is relative. Thus the cup is to Dionysus as the shield to Ares. The cup may, therefore, be called the shield of Dionysus, and the shield the cup of Ares. Or, again, as old age is to life, so is evening to day. Evening may therefore be called the old age of the day, and old age, the evening of life, or, in the phrase of Empedocles, 
life setting Sunday for some of the terms of the proportion there is at times no word in existence, still the metaphor may be used. For instance, to scatter seed is called sowing, but the action of the sun in scattering his rays is nameless. Still this process bears to the sun the same relation as sowing to the seed. Hence the expression of the poet sowing the God created light. There is another way in which this kind of metaphor may be employed. We may apply an alien term, and then deny of that term one of its proper attributes, as if we were to call the shield, not the cup of Ares, but the wineless cup. An ornamental word, a newly coined word is one which has never been even in local use, but is adopted by the poet himself. Some such words there appear to be, as Epsilon Rho Nu Upsilon Gamma Epsilon Sigma, Sprouters, 4 Kappa Epsilon Rho Alpha Tau Alpha, Horns, and Alpha Rho ETA Tau ETA Rho, Supplicator, 4 Iota Epsilon Rho Epsilon Upsilon Sigma, Priest. A word is lengthened when its own vowel is exchanged for a longer one, or when a syllable is inserted. A word is contracted when some part of it is removed. Instances of lengthening are pi omicron lambda eta omicron sigma for pi omicron lambda epsilon omega sigma, and pi eta lambda eta iota alpha delta epsilon omega for pi eta lambda epsilon iota delta omicron upsilon, of contraction kappa rho iota, delta omega, and omicron psi as in mu iota alpha slash gamma iota nu epsilon tau alpha iota slash alpha mu phi omicron tau epsilon rho omega nu slash omicron psi. An altered word is one in which part of the ordinary form is left unchanged, and part is recast, as in delta epsilon 11 iota tau epsilon rho omicron nu slash kappa alpha tau alpha slash mu alpha zeta omicron nu, Delta Epsilon 11 Iota Tau Epsilon Rho Omicron Nu is for Delta Epsilon 11 Iota Omicron Nu. Nouns in themselves are either masculine, feminine, or neuter. Masculine are such as end in Nu, Rho, Sigma, or in some letter compounded with Sigma, comma these being 2, and 11. Feminine, such as end in vowels that are always long, namely ETA and Omega, and of vowels that admit of lengthening those in alpha. Thus the number of letters in which nouns masculine and feminine end is the same, for psi and eleven are equivalent to endings in sigma. No noun ends in a mute or a vowel short by nature. Three only end in iota comma mu eta lambda iota, kappa omicron mu mu iota, pi epsilon pi epsilon rho iota, five end in upsilon. Neuter nouns end in these two latter vowels, also in nu and sigma dot. XXII The perfection of style is to be clear without being mean. The clearest style is that which uses only current or proper words, at the same time it is mean witness the poetry of Cleophon and of Stenilus. That diction, on the other hand, is lofty and raised above the commonplace which employs unusual words. By unusual, I mean strange, or rare, words, metaphorical, lengthened anything, in short, that differs from the normal idiom. Yet a style wholly composed of such words is either a riddle or a jargon, a riddle, if it consists of metaphors, a jargon, if it consists of strange, or rare, words. For the essence of a riddle is to express true facts under impossible combinations. Now this cannot be done by any arrangement of ordinary words, but by the use of metaphor it can. Such is the riddle a man I saw who on another man had glued the bronze by aid of fire, and others of the same kind. A diction that is made up of strange, or rare, terms is a jargon. A certain infusion, therefore, of these elements is necessary to style, for the strange, or rare, word the metaphorical, the ornamental, and the other kinds above mentioned, will raise it above the commonplace and mean, while the use of proper words will make it perspicuous. But nothing contributes more to produce a clearness of diction that is remote from commonness than the lengthening, contraction, and alteration of words. 
for by deviating in exceptional cases from the normal idiom, the language will gain distinction, while, at the same time, the partial conformity with usage will give perspicuity. The critics, therefore, are in error who censure these licenses of speech, and hold the author up to ridicule. Thus Euclides, the elder, declared that it would be an easy matter to be a poet if you might lengthen syllables at will. He caricatured the practice in the very form of his diction, as in the verse, Epsilon pi iota chi alpha rho eta nu slash epsilon iota delta omicron nu slash mu alpha rho alpha theta omega nu alpha delta epsilon slash beta alpha delta iota zeta omicron nu tau alpha, or, omicron upsilon kappa slash alpha nu slash gamma slash epsilon rho alpha mu epsilon nu omicron sigma slash tau omicron nu slash epsilon kappa epsilon iota nu omicron upsilon slash epsilon lambda lambda epsilon beta omicron rho omicron nu. To employ such license at all obtrusively is, no doubt, grotesque, but in any mode of poetic diction there must be moderation. Even metaphors, strange, or rare, words, or any similar forms of speech, would produce the like effect if used without propriety and with the express purpose of being ludicrous. How great a difference is made by the appropriate use of lengthening, may be seen in epic poetry by the insertion of ordinary forms in the verse. So, again, if we take a strange, or rare, word, a metaphor, or any similar mode of expression, and replace it by the current or proper term, the truth of our observation will be manifest. For example Aeschylus and Euripides each composed the same iambic line. But the alteration of a single word by Euripides, who employed the rarer term instead of the ordinary one, makes one verse appear beautiful and the other trivial. Aeschylus in his Philoctet says, Phi alpha gamma epsilon delta alpha iota nu alpha slash delta slash eta slash mu omicron upsilon slash sigma alpha rho kappa alpha sigma slash epsilon rho theta iota epsilon iota slash pi omicron delta omicron sigma. Euripides substitutes theta omicron iota nu alpha tau alpha iota feasts on four epsilon sigma theta iota epsilon iota feeds on. Again, in the line nu upsilon nu slash delta epsilon slash mu slash epsilon omega nu slash omicron lambda iota gamma iota gamma upsilon sigma slash tau epsilon slash kappa alpha iota slash omicron upsilon tau iota delta alpha nu omicron sigma slash kappa alpha iota slash alpha epsilon iota kappa eta sigma, the difference will be felt if we substitute the common words, nu upsilon nu slash delta epsilon slash mu slash epsilon omega nu slash mu iota kappa rho omicron sigma slash tau epsilon slash kappa alpha iota slash alpha rho theta epsilon nu iota kappa omicron sigma slash kappa alpha iota slash alpha epsilon iota delta gamma sigma or if for the line Delta iota phi rho omicron nu slash alpha epsilon iota kappa epsilon lambda iota omicron nu slash kappa alpha tau alpha theta epsilon iota sigma slash omicron lambda iota gamma eta nu slash tau epsilon slash tau rho alpha pi epsilon iota sigma slash omicron lambda iota gamma eta nu slash tau epsilon slash tau rho alpha pi epsilon zeta alpha nu we read. Delta iota phi rho omicron nu slash mu omicron chi theta eta rho omicron nu slash kappa alpha tau alpha theta epsilon iota sigma slash mu iota kappa rho alpha nu slash tau epsilon slash tau rho alpha pi epsilon zeta alpha nu. Or, for eta iota omicron nu epsilon sigma slash beta omicron omicron omega rho iota nu. ETA iota omicron nu epsilon sigma kappa rho alpha zeta omicron upsilon rho iota nu again, Arafrades ridiculed the tragedians for using phrases which no one would employ in ordinary speech, for example, delta omega mu alpha tau omega nu slash alpha pi omicron instead of alpha pi omicron slash delta omega mu alpha tau omega nu, rho epsilon theta epsilon nu, Epsilon gamma omega slash delta epsilon slash nu iota nu. 
Alpha Chi Iota Lambda Lambda Epsilon Omega Sigma Slash Pi Epsilon Rho Iota Instead of Pi Epsilon Rho Iota Slash Alpha Chi Iota Lambda Lambda Epsilon Omega Sigma, and the like. It is precisely because such phrases are not part of the current idiom that they give distinction to the style. This, however, he failed to see. It is a great matter to observe propriety in these several modes of expression, as also in compound words, strange, or rare, words, and so forth. But the greatest thing by far is to have a command of metaphor. This alone cannot be imparted by another, it is the mark of genius, for to make good metaphors implies an eye for resemblances. Of the various kinds of words, the compound are best adapted to dithyrams, rare words to heroic poetry, metaphors to iambic. In heroic poetry, indeed, all these varieties are serviceable. But in iambic verse, which reproduces, as far as may be, familiar speech, the most appropriate words are those which are found even in prose. These are the current or proper, the metaphorical, the ornamental. Concerning tragedy and imitation by means of action this may suffice. XXIII as to that poetic imitation which is narrative in form and employs a single meter, the plot manifestly ought, as in a tragedy, to be constructed on dramatic principles. It should have for its subject a single action, whole and complete, with a beginning, a middle, and an end. It will thus resemble a living organism in all its unity, and produce the pleasure proper to it. It will differ in structure from historical compositions, which of necessity present not a single action, but a single period, and all that happened within that period to one person or to many, little connected together as the events may be. For as the sea fight at Salamis and the battle with the Carthaginians in Sicily took place at the same time, but did not tend to any one result, so in the sequence of events, one thing sometimes follows another, and yet no single result is thereby produced. Such is the practice, we may say, of most poets. Here again, then, as has been already observed, the transcendent excellence of Homer is manifest. He never attempts to make the whole war of Troy the subject of his poem, though that war had a beginning and an end. It would have been too vast a theme, and not easily embraced in a single view. If, again, he had kept it within moderate limits, it must have been overcomplicated by the variety of the incidents. As it is, he detaches a single portion, and admits as episodes many events from the general story of the war such as the catalogue of the ships and others thus diversifying the poem. All other poets take a single hero, a single period, or an action single indeed, but with a multiplicity of parts. Thus did the author of the Cypria and of the Little Iliad. For this reason the Iliad and the Odyssey each furnish the subject of one tragedy, or, at most, of two, while the Cypria supplies materials for many, and the Little Iliad for eight the award of the arms, the Philoctets, the Neoptolemus, the Eurypylus, the mendicant Odysseus, the Laconian women, the fall of Ilium, the departure of the fleet. XXIV again, epic poetry must have as many kinds as tragedy, it must be simple, or complex, or ethical, or pathetic. The parts also, with the exception of song and spectacle, are the same, for it requires reversals of the situation, recognitions, and scenes of suffering. Moreover, the thoughts and the diction must be artistic. In all these respects Homer is our earliest and sufficient model. Indeed each of his poems has a twofold character. The Iliad is at once simple and pathetic, and the Odyssey complex, for recognition scenes run through it, and at the same time ethical. Moreover, in diction and thought they are supreme. Epic poetry differs from tragedy in the scale on which it is constructed, and in its meter. As regards scale or length, we have already laid down an adequate limit the beginning and the end must be capable of being brought within a single view. 
This condition will be satisfied by poems on a smaller scale than the old epics, and answering in length to the group of tragedies presented at a single sitting. Epic poetry has, however, a great especial capacity for enlarging its dimensions, and we can see the reason. In tragedy we cannot imitate several lines of actions carried on at one and the same time, we must confine ourselves to the action on the stage and the part taken by the players. But in epic poetry, owing to the narrative form, many events simultaneously transacted can be presented, and these, if relevant to the subject, add mass and dignity to the poem. The epic has here an advantage, and one that conduces to grandeur of effect, to diverting the mind of the hearer, and relieving the story with varying episodes. For sameness of incident soon produces satiety, and makes tragedies fail on the stage. As for the meter, the heroic measure has proved its fitness by the test of experience. If a narrative poem in any other meter or in many meters were now composed, it would be found incongruous. For of all measures the heroic is the stateliest and the most massive, and hence it most readily admits rare words and metaphors, which is another point in which the narrative form of imitation stands alone. On the other hand, the iambic and the trochaic tetrameter are stirring measures, the latter being akin to dancing, the former expressive of action. Still more absurd would it be to mix together different meters, as was done by Cheleman. Hence no one has ever composed a poem on a great scale in any other than heroic verse. Nature herself, as we have said, teaches the choice of the proper measure. Homer, admirable in all respects, has the special merit of being the only poet who rightly appreciates the part he should take himself. The poet should speak as little as possible in his own person, for it is not this that makes him an imitator. Other poets appear themselves upon the scene throughout, and imitate but little and rarely. Homer, after a few prefatory words, at once brings in a man, or woman, or other personage, none of them wanting in characteristic qualities, but each with a character of his own. The element of the wonderful is required in tragedy. The irrational, on which the wonderful depends for its chief effects, has wider scope in epic poetry, because there the person acting is not seen. Thus, the pursuit of Hector would be ludicrous if placed upon the stage the Greeks standing still and not joining in the pursuit, and Achilles waving them back. But in the epic poem the absurdity passes unnoticed. Now the wonderful is pleasing, as may be inferred from the fact that everyone tells a story with some addition of his own, knowing that his hearers like it. It is Homer who has chiefly taught other poets the art of telling lies skillfully. The secret of it lies in a fallacy, for, assuming that if one thing is or becomes, a second is or becomes, men imagine that, if the second is, the first likewise is or becomes. But this is a false inference. Hence, where the first thing is untrue, it is quite unnecessary, provided the second be true, to add that the first is or has become. For the mind, knowing the second to be true, falsely infers the truth of the first. There is an example of this in the bath scene of the Odyssey. Accordingly, the poet should prefer probable impossibilities to improbable possibilities. The tragic plot must not be composed of irrational parts. Everything irrational should, if possible, be excluded, or, at all events, it should lie outside the action of the play, as, in the Oedipus, the hero's ignorance as to the manner of Leo's death, not within the drama as in the Electra, the messenger's account of the Pythian games, or, as in the Mysians, the man who has come from Tasia to Mysia and is still speechless. The plea that otherwise the plot would have been ruined, is ridiculous, such a plot should not in the first instance be constructed. But once the irrational has been introduced and an air of likelihood imparted to it, we must accept it in spite of the absurdity. Take even the irrational incidents in the Odyssey, 
where Odysseus is left upon the shore of Ithaca. How intolerable even these might have been would be apparent if an inferior poet were to treat the subject. As it is, the absurdity is veiled by the poetic charm with which the poet invests it. The diction should be elaborated in the pauses of the action, where there is no expression of character or thought. For, conversely, character and thought are merely obscured by a diction that is over-brilliant. XXV With respect to critical difficulties and their solutions, the number and nature of the sources from which they may be drawn may be thus exhibited. The poet being an imitator, like a painter or any other artist, must of necessity imitate one of three objects things as they were or are, things as they are said or thought to be, or things as they ought to be. The vehicle of expression is language either current terms or, it may be, rare words or metaphors. There are also many modifications of language, which we concede to the poets. Add to this that the standard of correctness is not the same in poetry and politics, any more than in poetry and any other art. Within the art of poetry itself there are two kinds of faults, those which touch its essence, and those which are accidental. If a poet has chosen to imitate something, but has imitated it incorrectly, through want of capacity, the error is inherent in the poetry. But if the failure is due to a wrong choice if he has represented a horse as throwing out both his off legs at once, or introduced technical inaccuracies in medicine, for example, or in any other art the error is not essential to the poetry. These are the points of view from which we should consider and answer the objections raised by the critics. First as to matters which concern the poet's own art. If he describes the impossible, he is guilty of an error but the error may be justified, if the end of the art be thereby attained, the end being that already mentioned, if, that is, the effect of this or any other part of the poem is thus rendered more striking. A case in point is the pursuit of Hector. If, however, the end might have been as well, or better, attained without violating the special rules of the poetic art, the error is not justified, for every kind of error should, if possible, be avoided. Again, does the error touch the essentials of the poetic art, or some accident of it? For example not to know that a hind has no horns is a less serious matter than to paint it inartistically. Further, if it be objected that the description is not true to fact, the poet may perhaps reply but the objects are as they ought to be, just as Sophocles said that he drew men as they ought to be, Euripides, as they are. In this way the objection may be met. If, however, the representation be of neither kind, the poet may answer this is how men say the thing is. This applies to tales about the gods. It may well be that these stories are not higher than fact nor yet true to fact, they are, very possibly, what Xenophane says of them. But anyhow, this is what is said. Again, a description may be no better than the fact, still, it was the fact, as in the passage about the arms, upright upon their butt ends stood the spears. This was the custom then, as it now is among the Illyrians. Again, in examining whether what has been said or done by someone is poetically right or not, we must not look merely to the particular act or saying, and ask whether it is poetically good or bad. We must also consider by whom it is said or done, to whom, when, by what means, or for what end, whether, for instance, it be to secure a greater good, or avert a greater evil. Other difficulties may be resolved by due regard to the usage of language. We may note a rare word, as in Omicron Upsilon Rho Eta Alpha Sigma Slash Mu Epsilon Nu Slash Pi Rho Omega Tau Omicron Nu, where the poet perhaps employs Omicron Upsilon Rho Eta Alpha Sigma not in the sense of mules, but of sentinels. So, again, of Dolan, ill-favored indeed he was to look upon. It is not meant that his body was ill-shaped, but that his face was ugly, 
for the Cretans use the word epsilon upsilon epsilon iota delta epsilon sigma, well favored, to denote a fair face. Again, zeta omega rho omicron tau epsilon rho omicron nu slash delta epsilon slash kappa epsilon rho alpha iota epsilon, mix the drink livelier, does not mean mix it stronger as for hard drinkers, but mix it quicker. Sometimes an expression is metaphorical, as now all gods and men were sleeping through the night, while at the same time the poet says, often indeed as he turned his gaze to the Trojan plain, he marveled at the sound of flutes and pipes. All is here used metaphorically for many, all being a species of many. So in the verse alone she hath no part, Omicron iota eta, alone, is metaphorical, for the best known may be called the only one. Again, the solution may depend upon accent or breathing. Thus Hippias of Thaza solved the difficulties in the lines delta iota delta omicron mu epsilon nu, delta iota delta omicron mu epsilon nu, delta epsilon slash omicron iota and tau omicron slash mu epsilon nu slash omicron upsilon, omicron upsilon, kappa alpha tau alpha pi upsilon theta epsilon tau alpha iota slash omicron mu beta rho omega. Or again, the question may be solved by punctuation, as in empedocles of a sudden things became mortal that before had learned to be immortal, and things unmixed before mixed. Or again, by ambiguity of meaning as pi alpha rho omega chi eta kappa epsilon nu slash delta epsilon slash pi lambda epsilon omega slash nu upsilon 11, where the word pi lambda epsilon omega is ambiguous. Or by the usage of language. Thus any mixed drink is called omicron iota nu omicron sigma, wine. Hence Ganymede is said to pour the wine to Zeus, though the gods do not drink wine. So two workers in iron are called chi alpha lambda kappa epsilon alpha sigma, or workers in bronze. This, however, may also be taken as a metaphor. Again, when a word seems to involve some inconsistency of meaning, we should consider how many senses it may bear in the particular passage. For example, there was stayed the spear of bronze we should ask in how many ways we may take being checked there. The true mode of interpretation is the precise opposite of what Glaucon mentions. Critics, he says, jump at certain groundless conclusions, they pass adverse judgment and then proceed to reason on it, and, assuming that the poet has said whatever they happen to think, find fault if a thing is inconsistent with their own fancy. The question about Icarius has been treated in this fashion. The critics imagine he was a Lacedaemonian. They think it strange, therefore, that Telemachus should not have met him when he went to Lace Daemon. But the Cephalenian story may perhaps be the true one. They allege that Odysseus took a wife from among themselves, and that her father was Icadius not Icarius. It is merely a mistake, then, that gives plausibility to the objection. In general, the impossible must be justified by reference to artistic requirements, or to the higher reality, or to received opinion. With respect to the requirements of art, a probable impossibility is to be preferred to a thing improbable and yet possible. Again, it may be impossible that there should be men such as Zeuxis painted. Yes, we say, but the impossible is the higher thing, for the ideal type must surpass the reality. To justify the irrational, we appeal to what is commonly said to be. In addition to which, we urge that the irrational sometimes does not violate reason, just as it is probable that a thing may happen contrary to probability. Things that sound contradictory should be examined by the same rules as in dialectical refutation whether the same thing is meant, in the same relation, and in the same sense. We should therefore solve the question by reference to what the poet says himself, or to what is tacitly assumed by a person of intelligence. The element of the irrational, and, similarly, depravity of character, are justly censured when there is no inner necessity for introducing them. 
such as the irrational element in the introduction of Aegis by Euripides and the badness of many laws in the Orestes. Thus, there are five sources from which critical objections are drawn. Things are censured either as impossible, or irrational, or morally hurtful, or contradictory, or contrary to artistic correctness. The answers should be sought under the twelve heads above mentioned. XXVI The question may be raised whether the epic or tragic mode of imitation is the higher. If the more refined art is the higher, and the more refined in every case is that which appeals to the better sort of audience, the art which imitates anything and everything is manifestly most unrefined. The audience is supposed to be too dull to comprehend unless something of their own is thrown in by the performers, who therefore indulge in restless movements. Bad flute players twist and twirl, if they have to represent the quoit throw, or hustle the corypheus when they perform the scylla. Tragedy, it is said, has the same defect. We may compare the opinion that the older actors entertained of their successors. Meniscus used to call Callipides ape on account of the extravagance of his action, and the same view was held of Pindarus. Tragic art, then, as a whole, stands to epic in the same relation as the younger to the elder actors. So we are told that epic poetry is addressed to a cultivated audience, who do not need gesture, tragedy, to an inferior public. Being then unrefined, it is evidently the lower of the two. Now, in the first place, this censure attaches not to the poetic but to the histrionic art, for gesticulation may be equally overdone in epic recitation, as by Sosistratus, or in lyrical competition, as by Nasatheus the Opuntian. Next, all action is not to be condemned any more than all dancing but only that of bad performers. Such was the fault found in Callipides, as also in others of our own day, who are censured for representing degraded women. Again, tragedy like epic poetry produces its effect even without action, it reveals its power by mere reading. If, then, in all other respects it is superior, this fault, we say, is not inherent in it. And superior it is, because it has all the epic elements it may even use the epic meter with the music and spectacular effects as important accessories, and these produce the most vivid of pleasures. Further, it has vividness of impression in reading as well as in representation. Moreover, the art attains its end within narrower limits, for the concentrated effect is more pleasurable than one which is spread over a long time and so diluted. What? for example, would be the effect of the Oedipus of Sophocles, if it were cast into a form as long as the Iliad. Once more, the epic imitation has less unity, as is shown by this, that any epic poem will furnish subjects for several tragedies. Thus if the story adopted by the poet has a strict unity, it must either be concisely told and appear truncated, or, if it conform to the epic canon of length, it must seem weak and watery. Such length implies some loss of unity, if, I mean, the poem is constructed out of several actions, like the Iliad and the Odyssey, which have many such parts, each with a certain magnitude of its own. Yet these poems are as perfect as possible in structure, each is, in the highest degree attainable, an imitation of a single action. If, then, tragedy is superior to epic poetry in all these respects, and, moreover, fulfills its specific function better as an art for each art ought to produce, not any chance pleasure, but the pleasure proper to it, as already stated it plainly follows that tragedy is the higher art, as attaining its end more perfectly. Thus much may suffice concerning tragic and epic poetry in general, their several kinds and parts, with the number of each and their differences, the causes that make a poem good or bad, the objections of the critics and the answers to these objections. End of the Project Gutenberg ebook The Poetics of Aristotle Updated editions will replace the previous one The old editions will be renamed. 
Creating the works from print editions not protected by U.S. copyright law means that no one owns a United States copyright in these works, so the Foundation, and you, can copy and distribute it in the United States without permission and without paying copyright royalties. Special rules, set forth in the general terms of use part of this license, apply to copying and distributing Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark concept and trademark. Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark, and may not be used if you charge for an ebook, except by following the terms of the trademark license, including paying royalties for use of the Project Gutenberg trademark. If you do not charge anything for copies of this ebook, complying with the trademark license is very easy. You may use this ebook for nearly any purpose such as creation of derivative works, reports, performances, and research. Project Gutenberg ebooks may be modified and printed and given away. You may do practically anything in the United States with ebooks not protected by U.S. copyright law. Redistribution is subject to the trademark license, especially commercial redistribution. Start, full license the full Project Gutenberg license. Please read this before you distribute or use this work to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark mission of promoting the free distribution of electronic works, by using or distributing this work, or any other work associated in any way with the phrase Project Gutenberg you agree to comply with all the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark license available with this file or online at www.gutenberg.org slash license. Section 1. General Terms of Use and Redistributing Project Gutenberg Trademark Electronic Works 1.A. By reading or using any part of this Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work, you indicate that you have read, understand, Agree to and accept all the terms of this license and intellectual property, trademark slash copyright, agreement. If you do not agree to abide by all the terms of this agreement, you must cease using and return or destroy all copies of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works in your possession. If you paid a fee for obtaining a copy of or access to a Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work and you do not agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement, you may obtain a refund from the person or entity to whom you paid the fee as set forth in paragraph 1.E.8. 1.B Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark. It may only be used on or associated in any way with an electronic work by people who agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement. There are a few things that you can do with most Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works even without complying with the full terms of this agreement. See paragraph 1.C below. There are a lot of things you can do with Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works if you follow the terms of this agreement and help preserve free future access to Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works. See paragraph 1.E below. 1.C. The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the Foundation or PGLOF, owns a compilation copyright in the collection of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works. Nearly all the individual works in the collection are in the public domain in the United States. If an individual work is unprotected by copyright law in the United States and you are located in the United States, we do not claim a right to prevent you from copying, distributing, performing, displaying, or creating derivative works based on the work as long as all references to Project Gutenberg are removed. Of course, we hope that you will support the Project Gutenberg trademark mission of promoting free access to electronic works by freely sharing Project Gutenberg trademark works in compliance with the terms of this agreement for keeping the Project Gutenberg trademark name associated with the work. You can easily comply with the terms of this agreement by keeping this work in the same format with its attached full Project Gutenberg trademark license when you share it without charge with others. 1.D. The copyright laws of the place where you are located also govern what you can do with this work. Copyright laws in most countries are in a constant state of change. If you are outside the United States, 
check the laws of your country in addition to the terms of this agreement before downloading, copying, displaying, performing, distributing or creating derivative works based on this work or any other Project Gutenberg trademark work. The Foundation makes no representations concerning the copyright status of any work in any country other than the United States. 1.e Unless you have removed all references to Project Gutenberg, 1.e.1. The following sentence, with active links to, or other immediate access to, the full Project Gutenberg trademark license must appear prominently whenever any copy of a Project Gutenberg trademark work, any work on which the phrase Project Gutenberg appears, or with which the phrase Project Gutenberg is associated, is accessed, displayed, performed, viewed, copied or distributed, this ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.org. If you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this ebook. 1.e.2 If an individual Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work is derived from texts not protected by U.S. copyright law, does not contain a notice indicating that it is posted with permission of the copyright holder, the work can be copied and distributed to anyone in the United States without paying any fees or charges. If you are redistributing or providing access to a work with the phrase Project Gutenberg associated with or appearing on the work, you must comply either with the requirements of paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 or obtain permission for the use of the work and the Project Gutenberg trademark trademark as set forth in paragraphs 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.3 If an individual Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work is posted with the permission of the copyright holder, your use and distribution must comply with both paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 and any additional terms imposed by the copyright holder. Additional terms will be linked to the Project Gutenberg trademark license for all works posted with the permission of the copyright holder found at the beginning of this work. 1.e.4 do not unlink or detach or remove the full Project Gutenberg trademark license terms from this work, or any files containing a part of this work or any other work associated with Project Gutenberg trademark. 1.e.5 Do not copy, display, perform, distribute or redistribute this electronic work, or any part of this electronic work, without prominently displaying the sentence set forth in paragraph 1.e.1 with active links or immediate access to the full terms of the Project Gutenberg trademark license. 1.e.6 You may convert to and distribute this work in any binary, compressed, marked up, non-proprietary or proprietary form, including any word processing or hypertext form. However, if you provide access to or distribute copies of a Project Gutenberg trademark work in a format other than plain vanilla ASCII or other format used in the official version posted on the official Project Gutenberg trademark website, www.gutenberg.org, you must, at no additional cost, fee, or expense to the user, provide a copy, a means of exporting a copy, or a means of obtaining a copy upon request, of the work in its original plain vanilla ASCII or other form. Any alternate format must include the full Project Gutenberg trademark license as specified in paragraph 1.e.1. 1.e.7 Do not charge a fee for access to, viewing, displaying, performing, copying or distributing any Project Gutenberg trademark works unless you comply with paragraph 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.8 You may charge a reasonable fee for copies of or providing access to or distributing Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works provided that, 
you pay a royalty fee of 20% of the gross profits you derive from the use of Project Gutenberg trademark works calculated using the method you already use to calculate your applicable taxes. The fee is owed to the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark trademark, but he has agreed to donate royalties under this paragraph to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. Royalty payments must be paid within 60 days following each date on which you prepare, or are legally required to prepare, your periodic tax returns. Royalty payments should be clearly marked as such and sent to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation at the address specified in Section 4, Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. You provide a full refund of any money paid by a user who notifies you in writing, or by email, within 30 days of receipt that s he does not agree to the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark license. You must require such a user to return or destroy all copies of the works possessed in a physical medium and discontinue all use of and all access to other copies of Project Gutenberg trademark works. You provide, in accordance with paragraph 1.f.3, a full refund of any money paid for a work or a replacement copy, if a defect in the electronic work is discovered and reported to you within 90 days of receipt of the work. You comply with all other terms of this agreement for free distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark works. 1.e.9 If you wish to charge a fee or distribute a Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work or group of works on different terms than are set forth in this agreement, you must obtain permission in writing from the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the manager of the Project Gutenberg trademark trademark. Contact the foundation as set forth in section 3 below. 1.f1.f.1 Project Gutenberg volunteers and employees expend considerable effort to identify, do copyright research on, transcribe and proofread works not protected by U.S. copyright law in creating the Project Gutenberg trademark collection. Despite these efforts, Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works, and the medium on which they may be stored, may contain defects, such as, but not limited to, incomplete, inaccurate or corrupt data, transcription errors, a copyright or other intellectual property infringement, a defective or damaged disk or other medium, a computer virus, or computer codes that damage or cannot be read by your equipment. 1.f.2 Limited Warranty disclaimer of damages, except for the right of replacement or refund described in paragraph 1.f.3, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark trademark, and any other party distributing a Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work under this agreement, disclaim all liability to you for damages, costs, and expenses, including legal fees. You agree that you have no remedies for negligence, strict liability, breach of warranty or breach of contract except those provided in paragraph 1.f.3. You agree that the foundation, the trademark owner, and any distributor under this agreement will not be liable to you for actual, direct, indirect, consequential, punitive, or incidental damages even if you give notice of the possibility of such damage. 1.f.3 Limited right of replacement or refund, if you discover a defect in this electronic work within 90 days of receiving it, you can receive a refund of the money, if any, you paid for it by sending a written explanation to the person you received the work from. If you received the work on a physical medium, you must return the medium with your written explanation. The person or entity that provided you with the defective work may elect to provide a replacement copy in lieu of a refund. If you receive the work electronically, the person or entity providing it to you may choose to give you a second opportunity to receive the work electronically in lieu of a refund. If the second copy is also defective, you may demand a refund in writing without further opportunities to fix the problem. 1.f.4 
except for the limited right of replacement or refund set forth in paragraph 1.f.3, this work is provided to you as is, with no other warranties of any kind, express or implied, including but not limited to warranties of merchantability or fitness for any purpose. 1.f.5 some states do not allow disclaimers of certain implied warranties or the exclusion or limitation of certain types of damages. If any disclaimer or limitation set forth in this agreement violates the law of the state applicable to this agreement, the agreement shall be interpreted to make the maximum disclaimer or limitation permitted by the applicable state law. The invalidity or unenforceability of any provision of this agreement shall not void the remaining provisions. 1.f.6. Indemnity, you agree to indemnify and hold the foundation, the trademark owner, any agent, or employee of the foundation, anyone providing copies of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works in accordance with this agreement, and any volunteers associated with the production, promotion, and distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works, harmless from all liability, costs, and expenses, including legal fees, that arise directly or indirectly from any of the following which you do or cause to occur. a. Distribution of this or any Project Gutenberg trademark work. b. Alteration, modification, or additions or deletions to any Project Gutenberg trademark work. and c. Any defect you cause. Section 2 Information about the mission of Project Gutenberg Trademark Project Gutenberg Trademark is synonymous with the free distribution of electronic works in formats readable by the widest variety of computers including obsolete, old, middle-aged, and new computers. It exists because of the efforts of hundreds of volunteers and donations from people in all walks of life. Volunteers and financial support to provide volunteers with the assistance they need are critical to reaching Project Gutenberg Trademark S goals and ensuring that the Project Gutenberg Trademark collection will remain freely available for generations to come. In 2001, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation was created to provide a secure and permanent future for Project Gutenberg Trademark and future generations. To learn more about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation and how your efforts and donations can help, see Sections 3 and 4 and the Foundation Information page at www.gutenberg.org. Section 3 Information about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation is a non-profit 501, c. 3 educational corporation organized under the laws of the state of Mississippi and granted tax-exempt status by the Internal Revenue Service. The foundation's IN or federal tax identification number is 64-6221541. Contributions to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation are tax-deductible to the full extent permitted by U.S. federal laws and your state's laws. The foundation's business office is located at 809 North 1500 West, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84116801-596-1887. Email contact links and up-to-date contact information can be found at the foundation's website and official page at www.gutenberg.org slash contact section 4. Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation Project Gutenberg trademark depends upon and cannot survive without widespread public support and donations to carry out its mission of increasing the number of public domain and licensed works that can be freely distributed in machine-readable form accessible by the widest array of equipment including outdated equipment. Many small donations, $1 to $5,000, are particularly important to maintaining tax-exempt status with the IRS. The Foundation is committed to complying with the laws regulating charities and charitable donations in all 50 states of the United States. Compliance requirements are not uniform and it takes a considerable effort, much paperwork, and many fees to meet and keep up with these requirements. 
We do not solicit donations in locations where we have not received written confirmation of compliance. To send donations or determine the status of compliance for any particular state visit www.gutenberg.org slash donate. While we cannot and do not solicit contributions from states where we have not met the solicitation requirements, we know of no prohibition against accepting unsolicited donations from donors in such states who approach us with offers to donate. International donations are gratefully accepted, but we cannot make any statements concerning tax treatment of donations received from outside the United States. U.S. laws alone swamp our small staff. Please check the Project Gutenberg web pages for current donation methods and addresses. Donations are accepted in a number of other ways including checks, online payments, and credit card donations. To donate, please visit www.gutenberg.org slash donate. Section 5. General information about Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works Professor Michael S. Hart was the originator of the Project Gutenberg trademark concept of a library of electronic works that could be freely shared with anyone. For 40 years, he produced and distributed Project Gutenberg trademark ebooks with only a loose network of volunteer support. Project Gutenberg trademark ebooks are often created from several printed editions, all of which are confirmed as not protected by copyright in the U.S. unless a copyright notice is included. Thus, we do not necessarily keep ebooks in compliance with any particular paper edition. Most people start at our website, which has the main PG search facility, www.gutenberg.org. This website includes information about Project Gutenberg trademark, including how to make donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, how to help produce our new ebooks, and how to subscribe to our email newsletter to hear about new ebooks. The Poetics of Aristotle A Translation by S. H. Butcher Aristotle's Poetics I 234 V 6789 X 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 X X X X I X X I I X X I I I X X I V X X V X X V I The Full Project Gutenberg License